Welcome to Books of Titans. I'm Jason Staples, together with Eric Rostad, and this podcast is dedicated to the influences of influencers, the books that have helped shape prominent inventors, business leaders, athletes, intellectual scientists, and others. And we'll talk about what makes these books so important and influential, and at least attempt to have an intelligent discussion about these important works. Today, we're going to cover Stone Soup, a book focused on the delicate art of making soup out of stones. So as always, we're going to start with who recommended the book. <laughs> yeah, and in, in, in the book Tools of Titans, uh, Dr. Peter Diamandis is the one who recommended this book. And I'll give a little bit about Peter, and then I want to read the actual paragraph in the book from Tim Ferriss as to why Dr. Diamandis recommends this book. So uh, Dr. Diamandis is has been named one of the world's 50 greatest leaders by Fortune magazine. And his main claim to fame is he's the founder and executive chairman of the X Prize Foundation, best known for its $10 million Ansari X Prize for private space flight. Uh, today, X Prize leads the world in designing and operating large scale global com- competitions to solve market failures. Uh, he's founded more than 15 technology companies and is the executive chairman of Singularity University. Some members of his board include Tesla CEO Elon Musk and Google CEO Larry Page. Uh, one, here's the paragraph from Tools of Titans, and this is in Tim Ferriss's voice here. He says, Peter is a master pitchman. I've seen some greats, and he is right at the top. One of the books he recommends for cultivating deal-making deal ability is actually a children's book in a 10-minute read, Stone Soup. And here's a quote from Peter that uh, Tim is talking about. It's a children's story that is the best MBA degree you can read. Between the concept of super credibility and stone soup, you have a great foundation. If you're an entrepreneur in college or 60 years old and building your 20th company, stone soup is so critically important. And and that is why I'm looking forward to today's conversation because I did not get any of that out of this book. (laughs) And I'm trying to figure out how he got... This is like uh, the he thinks it's the greatest thing ever. So, I'm uh, I'm uh, looking forward to figuring out how that could be. The author of the the book we're discussing is Stone Soup uh, of, of Stone Soup is Marsha Brown, and I I put that sh- she's sort of the off- author because this is actually this story is actually an old French folk story, and there are numerous versions of this book in in different countries. So of course it would be soldiers coming back from uh, from different wars that are relevant to the, the country uh, of where the book was, was written. Uh, Marsha uh, has written over 30 children's book, books, and, and she passed away uh, a few years ago. So g- getting into our favorite quotes, um, it's not, not many to choose from because it's a very short book. And so the, the quote I chose from this book is, many thanks for what you have taught us. <laughs> we'll talk about that a, l- a little later because... Um, it, that's a quote coming from the townspeople and, and uh, the soldiers actually kind of cajoled uh, the townspeople into doing something, but then for them to, to end it with many thanks for what you taught us, uh, they didn't teach them anything. So Yeah, well, I mean, I thought that was ironic because you're the one that uh, that was saying, uh, you know, you didn't get anything out of the book. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> many thanks for what you have taught us. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, our, our discussion is surely going to be longer than it would take to actually read the whole thing. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, um, my favorite quote uh, is, they looked as hungry as they could. <clears throat> it was deep. It was deep. Yeah, yeah, because uh, the sol- the, the, in Marsha Brown's version of the story... Uh, it's three soldiers coming down the road who uh, need, you know, who haven't eaten in a couple days, and uh, they uh, they need to uh, get food from the local peasantry, but the peasantry uh, doesn't have food for them. So, you know, the peasantry to convince them, uh, the fuller quote is uh, that you know, so it went all through the village. Not a peasant had any food to give away. They all had good reasons. One family had used the grain for feed. Another had old, an old sick father to care for. All had too many mouths to fill. The villagers stood in the street and sighed. They looked as hungry as they could. <laughs> so yeah, the you know they're they're trying to look really hungry. Um, 
yeah, so <laughs> as far as the overview and um, initial reactions, let's get to the uh, to the big picture. Uh, I'll go ahead and let you start with this one. I, I just think it's an excellent children's book because the, the main message I got out of it is that force and deception are the best methods of stealing from war ravaged populations, which I think is just a, a great lesson for any any youngster these days. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't see a whole lot of force, but I did see a lot of deception in this story. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I I put down. Uh, the, the, the big picture, you know, lesson here is that powerfully or powerful, politically uh, connected oppressors uh, can use more than just intimidation to steer the impoverished, uneducated and presumably unwashed masses to their will for their own benefit. Uh, so, you know, it's a good again, a good lesson in um, the uh, the victory of the the upper classes and the bourgeoisie over the uh, proletarian masses. Uh, in order to uh, take away their their food uh, for their own purposes, so uh, so yeah, how about that? Yeah. <laughs> well, in, in another book I just read, it said the uh, history is written by the victors, and the memoirs are written by the victims. So uh, the the townspeople, I guess, probably have some good memoirs from this from this story. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. So yeah, again, uh, as we get into now, we're going to get into the spoiler zone. I mean, obviously this uh, podcast going a lot quicker than, uh, than the norm since uh, the book would already be over if we had just done a, an audiobook performance of it. And by the way, there, there, uh, there are multiple, I should mention, there are multiple versions of this old folk story, not just this one by, um, which was transmitted by Marsha Brown. Um, there are others where, you know, it's not just three soldiers. You might have a group of Buddhist monks uh, traveling to, to show the people how, uh, what, what true happiness is. And, you know, something that can obviously change the flavor of the story quite a bit, change the flavor of the soup, as it were, uh, pretty significantly when it's, you know, soldiers who are coming through town uh, and uh, versus, uh, uh Versus, you know, some older, wise, you know, traveling peasant or something. I mean, that, that can change, change the meaning of this pretty significantly uh, if you want to read it, if you want to do a close reading here. Uh, but, you know, in the, in the Marsha Clark, or, uh, wow, Marsha Brown, uh, getting back away from, uh, <laughs> from uh, the O.J. Simpson trial, uh, but uh, in the Marsha Brown version, with the three soldiers coming through town, uh, basically what happens is three so these three soldiers need to be fed. Uh, that you know they're they're hungry. They 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 need food as they continue on their journey. But the townspeople are peasants. They don't you know they're at subsistence level. They don't want to give any of their food to anyone else because you know that endangers their livelihood. Uh, but. Uh, you know, they're, you know, endangers their ability to say feed their, ch their children. Uh, so their excuses initially are well-founded uh, that, you know, they, they don't want to, they don't want to give anything to these soldiers, but, um, but the soldiers end up coming up with a ruse where they say they're going to, don't worry that, you know, we'll cook stone soup. And so they stick some stones in the, uh, in the cauldron. And then, you know, as the townspeople look on in curiosity, the townspeople, you know, uh, eventually are, you know, the, the, the soldiers use a little bit of chicanery and they say, well, you know, honestly, um, you know, if, uh, you know, the, any soup, you know, needs salt and pepper. So, uh, you know, if, and, and, you know, if we could just have some carrots and potatoes and some other stuff to stick in there, this stone soup would be even better. And the townspeople, of course, are deceived into bringing all their food out and, uh, you know, throwing a large feast that everyone eats and, you know, the soldiers eat, eat and have plenty and all this. And, uh, you know, that's the moral is that, uh, you know, supposedly the moral, at least that, uh, you know, if everybody just pitches in together, then, you know, there's plenty for everyone. But of course, you know, there are some other questions that are that at least I as an adult reader, you know, this is one that, that I did uh, read when I was a child. Uh, and as an adult reader, I, I, I have some additional questions afterwards. So what, what did you get out of the book when you were a child? Well, I mean, I think as a child, you, you look at the soldier. I mean, obviously, it's told from the soldier's perspective. Uh, so, you know, you look at the soldiers as creative and, uh, uh, you know, having found a, a, a good way to make sure that they got what they needed. And, you know, it's one of those as your kid, you're like, oh, yeah, you know, be inventive and uh, and and, you know, find, you know, they're they're 
there's always a way to ultimately uh, get what you need, and ultimately, you know, you've got to be flexible in the way you think, and and so on. Uh, and of course, people can be manipulated to do whatever you want them to do. I suppose is another thing that was internalized a little bit, but not necessarily what I would have said as a kid. But basically, I would have said, you know, yeah, just be creative. You know, find you know find way find creative ways to problem solve, and and you know everybody eventually will pitch in. Okay. <laughs> how about how about as an adult? As an adult, I get to wondering like now that everybody's brought all their food out and uh, they've thrown this big feast. Um, you know, the book kind of leaves off, leaves off there, and uh, you know, what about the famine that's going to come presumably, or the shortage of food that's going to presumably come uh, after all the people have you know, brought out all their, all the food that they didn't want to share at the beginning. Um, what about that? What about, uh, what about the downside after the pages of the book? That's the first thing that I, of course, think. And then, uh, you know, I also get to thinking about questions of hospitality and all sorts of other things that, you know, wouldn't it have been better if just, you know, the, the townspeople had been more generous to begin with and shown a little hospitality and, and given, uh, you know, as would be expected in at least ancient societies, you know, you come into the town square and, and you know, you're expected, it's expected that someone's going to take you home and give you some bread at least and, and some water and, and a place to sleep. And wouldn't it have been better if they'd have at least done that? And then they wouldn't have all been taken in to throw this big feast, uh, by, by these soldiers who then, you know, ate more than they needed, uh, you know, perhaps that's uh, another another aspect of that. But uh, yeah, I got to thinking a lot about those things. <laughs> well, and, and isn't it true that if, if you have a feast on an empty stomach, that uh, it doesn't bode well for your your digestive tract? <laughs> so I've heard, but uh, I've never really had uh, had had that problem. I suppose uh, my stomach hasn't been empty enough. Uh, I mean, I've had relatively pretty empty stomach after you know reasonably uh, from a, from a western perspective prolonged uh time without any significant food but i've i've never really had that problem i've heard it's heard it can be bad yeah but you know the of course the uh the soldiers are only a couple days so that's not a whole long a, a long uh, an especially long time and the townspeople are presumably eating at the normal subsistence level to that point so so they're okay it just means that they're you know holding back and, and, uh, now they're going to have to deal with less for a while. Now, you know, one, one lesson, of course, in all seriousness about this, uh, particular story, uh, that, that it's trying to get across is about this mindset of, of scarcity versus abundance. And I think that's where, uh, Diamandis wants to go with this is, um, is, th is, is being motivated by abundance thinking rather than scarcity thinking, rather than thinking that, you know, everything is, uh, zero sum, uh, you know, that, that thinking, you know, can lead to continued scarcity when, when everybody holds back. But if, if you think more abundantly and you more, and you're generous, uh, in the way that you go about things, then ultimately, uh, it can lead for, lead to increased abundance as everybody gets creative. Of course, that kind of gets lost in the deception thing for me, uh, as far as that goes. Uh, I do know that Diamandis himself sees this story as an allegory about entrepreneurship, and I suppose you could take that just a little bit. So Diamand Diamandis sees this story as a good allegory about entrepreneurship in the, in the sense that the stones are the big ideas in entrepreneurship, and then the contributions of the villagers are capital, resources, intellectual support offered by investors and strategic partners. And again, I'm just not seeing it, and, and where this breaks down for me is... Uh, I don't see the stones as the big ideas. I see the big idea as being what is initially from the soldiers of, of uh, let's let's make stone soup. Uh, so the stones themselves are, are part of that, uh, what the villages are, are putting in. But where I also see a breakdown with entrepreneurship is usually with entrepreneurship, there, there's, uh, there, there's the visionary, and then he gets people to join that vision. And that's an important part of it. They've got to buy into that vision to, to join in. And as we mentioned before, this one seems to be more about deception where, where they're not trying to, to clearly get somebody on board with, with the vision of, of, a, of a big feast, but they're, they're using deception to, uh, to, to get everyone to, to partake of this, to, to eventually get the, the final result. So I, <laughs> maybe I'm missing it, but I, I'm not seeing the, uh, the connection to, to entrepreneurship that 
that Diamandis sees and, and that, you know, that he, fe- he calls this book the best MBA degree you can read. Um, <laughs> I guess I just need to, to meditate on it a little bit more. Well, maybe you're just too honest. Maybe you, uh, maybe your, your, your view of how to portray big ideas is, uh, is, is a little bit different, but I mean, if you think about this as a fake it until you make it kind of, kind of uh, lesson, then that is certainly there. And to some degree, in, in a lot of entrepreneurial c- circumstances, that that is what has to be done, right? You fake it until you make it. You have an idea, which in this case is actually fleecing the, uh, the, uh, uh, the populace into, I suppose, the, the hospitality that one might rightfully expect. But, um, but you know, you have a big idea and then you, you hope to get support by, uh, by convincing everyone to do, to do that thing. So in that sense, I mean, I can see, I can see it. The problem here though, is that the, the ultimate lesson, I mean, if we want this to be about entrepreneurship, I, I'm of the view, you know, that generally speaking, good entrepreneurship, good ideas wind up being something that, that grows the whole pie, right? So it's not just a zero sum game where entrepreneurship involves my getting an idea that can, give me a, a larger slice of a pie that doesn't grow. Ideally, what you want is you want entrepreneurship, you want in- innovation to not only give the innovator the, you know, a, a little bit larger slice to work with, but to increase the size of the pie. So it's not just a zero sum thing, but you're, you know, the increase is, is accounted for by everybody being a little bit better off. And, you know, one of the best examples of this is, again, a smartphone. And, you know, you could go around and ask someone, uh, and it's been done, how much money would it cost? How much money would I have to, to give you for you to uh, completely give up your smartphone forever? Like you can never have a smartphone or any cellular device or anything like that ever again. And you have to completely disconnect from the internet, right? How much money would it, would, would someone, would it take for someone to be willing to do that? And, you know, people think about it. And a lot of people are saying, listen, you, know, you could give me a million dollars, but I'm not giving up my iPhone. I'm not giving up my Android because it is so thoroughly tied into the larger social fabric. And there's so many things that it makes easier and all this other stuff. And, you, you know, we could debate on the merits of whether or not that would be a good choice or not. But that's a situation where in terms of marginal utility, the value, the overall you know, size of the pie has increased. And, you know, the innovators of smartphones have been amply rewarded for that. Well, in this case, you don't see the, the, the pie doesn't get larger. The, 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 the villagers are not getting more food out of this unless, of course, the soldiers go back and, you know, they come back to the, to the town later on with uh, support from the, from the feudal lord or whatever. And uh, they, you know, they say, well, since you guys were willing to let us con you into feeding you, here's more food or whatever, which I, I don't imagine would happen. So that's where, I, again, the problem is, is that the innovation aspect of this and the, the, the reality that if you pitch a big idea and you get, and, and, you know, and it, and, and you show passion and you're, and you're persuasive enough to get other people to contribute to the larger game that, yeah, your, your entrepreneurship, your entrepreneurial idea can work. And without that, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, you know, that you need small bits of help from lots of people, which I think is what the wants to say about this. I think that's there if you don't account for sort of where it goes in the end and, and you, you don't deal with the problems of the subsistence context. And, you know, of course, the, there's a Business Insider um, article, which we'll link in the show notes, that talks about this from the Amanda's perspective. Uh, and, um, and the Business Insider article talks about the importance of passion as instrumental to this, to this story and, you know, how, this, how people love to contribute to passion. Uh, and one of the comments in the article is, you know, people love to, con- con- uh, uh, the, the story shows how people love to con- contribute to passion and you can't fake it. But of course I read that and I went, well, <laughs> the story is actually talking about how passion can be faked, <laughs> right? Wow. They're, you know, they they get this idea to put on the, the salesman face, uh, or, you know, the deceptive face to play, to play the showman and to get people to buy into an idea that is actually somewhat faked. So yeah, I, 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 I yeah. share your sort of concerns about some of those, those aspects of the story. When what you're saying about entrepreneurship, it's about adding value. And, and you're not going to make it as a company if you're not adding value. So uh, 
that could be taking two things that most people don't have the idea to put together. You put them together and you've added value. The, the cost of those two things separately is more money with, with the, the, the combination of those two things. And that could even be in, in food. So uh, a cook who knows what they're doing, they can take three food items that might cost uh, $2 at the store and, and they can sell it for, for five because they put it together in a u- unique way and, and it tastes good. Uh, but they've added, added value to, to two separate things. And, and to your point here, there's there's no value added other, other than maybe uh, a, a good feast. At, uh, for, but it, it's a temporary added value as opposed to uh, to more of a long term where uh, where entrepreneurship, uh, the the further goal of, of uh, starting the company would be more of longevity and, and having that idea of being able to multiply that to uh, to more and more people. Now, you know, one place where you could perhaps critique our critique here is uh, on one of the pages of the book, you know, the, the peasants themselves are saying, you know, uh, it says, uh, uh, soon the banquet was spread and everyone sat down to eat. Never had there been such a feast. Never had the peasants tasted such soup and fancy made from stones. And, you know, they they dance and they sing all into the night and all this. The peasants do get a good experience out of this. So if we're going to go back to, say, our last episode on uh, Rolf Potts's uh, vagabonding, then perhaps you could say, well, the, the peasants got something out of this. They got the experience benefit that was greater than the monetary benefit of the food or, you know, all of these things for, for later. So that, that could be a, that could be a takeaway that, that the soldiers taught them, first of all, how to have a good time, gave them a good recipe, uh, and showed them that if they all shared their resources and pooled a little bit more in more of a marketplace fashion, then perhaps they, uh, they would be able to eat better than if they took a subsistence view and kept their food to themselves, so that's another reading, and and if we read the villagers as just straight up greedy, then that could protect that could potentially be uh, more of a lesson there. So that that's that's another direction that that one could take this story that is perhaps more um, amenable to the Demandus reading. Okay, I'll, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Uh, however, the villagers are portrayed as not all that intelligent because they still think the soup came from. From stones. Yeah, so, so they didn't get the recipe. I think they would uh, take it a step further and, and get further further lessons out of it. Yeah. Yeah, that that does. I feel like the villagers, in some way, of uh, I, I completely missed the lesson of this. So. Yeah. Well, and, and again, you know, the, to further your point, after they say many thanks for what you've taught us, we shall never go hungry now that we know how to make soup from stones. Uh, well, if they're going to try to do it from stones, that's a problem. Now, if they are regarding the, the whole recipe as, you know, getting everybody together and, and sharing, then, you know, the soup from stones is a metaphor for, you know, everybody learning to get together and share. And if we all share, then we all are going to eat. We'll never, nobody will ever go hungry again because we'll all be eating from, you know, this common, uh, you know, this common pursuit. Which again, that that could be a that could be a, a way of reading it, I suppose. Yeah. So how about how about if we flip things around? You had some thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah. So I, I mean, one one way to flip that one around is again, it's a parable about the ability of the bourgeoisie to steer markets, to feed themselves, and foster boom bust cycles that only hurt the proletarian populace. To use you know. Uh, familiar Marxist words in a more market oriented uh, parable. Uh, in that case, you know, you get the bourgeoisie is able to convince people to jump in and, and, uh, and invest or do, you know, take specific pursuits that only benefit the bourgeoisie in the end, the, uh, the, the upper, the, the upper middle classes and upper classes, those who have, uh, access to the means of production and, and, um, uh, and land ownership and these sorts of things, real land ownership, not the bank owning it because the bank owns, you know, what you have under mortgage. Uh, if we want to use that, that language, you know, that again could be the kind of, uh, 
uh, reading that one could certainly take of this story. Uh, and, and again, the, the, the lesson for those who want to be on the good side of that is make sure you have the entrepreneurial ability to convince others to enrich you while potentially <laughs> impoverishing themselves and still being grateful <laughs> that they got the chance to enrich you. <laughs> that you that sir, is... <laughs> yes, thank you, sir. <laughs> so I suppose that is one other way of... Um, of reading that i don't know that we could stretch this uh uh, it's that it's worth stretching this to other additional angles of reading it but that's at least three different ways of of taking this story uh i suppose neither one of us uh feel that this is quite as uh as good of an mba lesson as um as demandis uh uh believes although again i do think that if we're going to take this from an entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurial uh, uh side that it is beneficial to understand the value of uh of passion and how people are capable of being uh persuaded to do things that may not even be in their own self-interest uh and and can be grateful uh about that and that that does say a lot about human psychology and the way that that groups work and uh can contribute to how we understand entrepreneurship but that said i i prefer uh to think of entrepreneurship as as trying to add value and uh and that's something that that I don't really see in this in this story. Yeah, and I I, I just hope the villagers had a good dentist because it, <laughs> it it never says that they didn't eat the stones along with the soup. So my my understanding from the book is that uh, along with all the beef and, and other items they put in the the soup, they they actually ate the stones as well. Well, they were large stones, so I don't I don't know that they could have done that. But either way, oh. you know, let's hope they had a good dentist. <laughs> hard to, hard to find a better conclusion than that. All right. Well, that's going to do it for us today. Before we get out of here, it's just a reminder that you can follow us along at booksoftitans.com. And of course, you can connect to us on Twitter or Instagram at Books of Titans. If you haven't already done so, you can subscribe to this podcast and find all of our past episodes through iTunes, the Android Marketplace, or your podcast manager of choice. If I could just put in a quick uh, suggestion, Jason and I both use Overcast for our podcasting uh, platform and it, it outstanding just released, uh, option now where you can go up to three times speed and then they also have a, a smart speed option that gets rid of a lot of the um, the breaks between when people are talking so it it actually cuts down quite a bit you can change it to your speed of choice and then put in that smart speed and that will save you a lot of time listening to to this podcast and, and other podcasts yeah since i started since I started listening to, since I started using Overcast, uh, according to its stats, Smart Speed has saved me an extra 66 hours beyond speed adjustments alone. Not bad. And this is a, uh, for the record, a non-sponsored uh, little blurb here. So uh, we have no no, no uh, monetary benefit from uh, from getting anything from from Overcast. We just both uh, have really enjoyed it. And if you're already using Overcast, please. If you're enjoying this this podcast, recommend us using the recommend feature on Overcast. Make sure to give us five-star ratings and effusive reviews on iTunes or your uh, marketplace, uh, uh, podcast marketplace of choice. And of course, share your f- favorite episodes on social media. We'll be back soon to discuss the next book, which will be Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. On behalf of Eric Rostad, I'm Jason Staples. This has been the Books of Titans podcast. Keep reading, keep improving, and thanks for listening. I made this.